500 years ago, in their jungle hideaway, Indus ancestors probably lived in blissful ignorance of the European empire builders' dreams of world conquest. Did they hear rumors of tall, bearded foreigners from faraway Portugal arriving in Malacca, the most powerful of the Malay Sultanates? Were they at all surprised when the Portuguese captured the thriving port and made it their stronghold for 130 years? And did they care when the Dutch ousted the Portuguese colonizers and set up their own administration? Did they approve when the Dutch negotiated a deal that delivered Malacca into the hands of the ultimate European empire builders, the British? But the British weren't satisfied with Malacca alone. They had their eyes on what the interior had to offer. These were exciting times for swashbuckling young fortune hunters from the British East India Company and the Colonial Office. Their takeover strategy was to provide naval and military support to the Malay sultans against rival chieftains in exchange for rights to mine for tin. There was money to be made, work to be done, and much labor to be recruited. The British imported Chinese coolies to work the tin mines. Here, in the wild west of the Far East, perseverance and ruthless ambition paid off handsomely. Adapt, save and invest became the philosophy. Wealth and respect were the rewards. Rubber was the next money spinner. And ads like this enticed many a British pioneer to travel halfway across the globe. Hundreds of thousands of rubber trees were planted and thousands of workers from India were brought in to tap them. Their insatiable lust for tin saw the British heading into Orang Asli country where they established settlements close to the mines. This town, Kuala Kubu Baru, owes its roots to that period of history. It was the British administrative hub for mining operations in the area. The town's first magistrate and tax collector was a young man named Cecil Ranking. He's fondly remembered by the Purta Orang Asli. Their ancestors even wrote a song about him. The song doesn't glorify him for ending slavery, which he did. Nor does it mark his death. He was drowned in a devastating flood, which the Orang Asli say was caused by the vengeful spirit of a white crocodile ranking shot dead. The song's actually very light-hearted. It recalls the day he fell off his horse, which ran off into the jungle with a red-faced ranking in wild pursuit. The British had their stories about the Orang Asli too. This is a journal entry from 1893. Some paid us a visit with a quantity of fresh vegetables which they were anxious to exchange for old sarongs and rice. We paid them in cash which they did not seem to like. There were three women in the party and they were certainly in need of more raiment. That encounter took place on this hill, a sacred Tamuan fertility site where the British had built a cool highland retreat. 1942, when the peace of the jungle was shattered as Japanese warplanes pounded British Malaya. It was only after the modern world had hit new heights of insanity that the war finally ended. The British were quick to return to Malaya to revive their business interests. Once again, Malayan rubber and tin flooded world markets. As war-torn countries rebuilt themselves, Malaya became the world's leading producer of these commodities. It was business better than usual until the communist insurgency. Once again, British Malaya was under attack. Many of the communist guerrillas were former resistance fighters against the Japanese. They didn't want British rule either. They befriended the Orang Asli, whose knowledge of the jungle was vital to them. To thwart them, the British herded the Orang Asli out of the jungle, resettling them in crude camps in town. Many found the heat, the change in diet, and the loss of their freedom impossible to bear. Inda was just a child when her family was brought out. Hundreds of people died. They got sick and died. Mother felt sick and died. Father felt sick and died. Both gone. The British realized they had made a foolish mistake. They tried a new tactic designed to win the hearts and minds of the Orang Asli. 
Instead of evicting them from their natural habitat, they built forts in jungle clearings. The idea was to befriend the natives, and of course there were lots of material incentives. Food supplies and medicines helped them gain the Orang Asli's loyalty. They swung over to the British, and the communists were slowly driven back. British anthropologists who had been studying the curious little natives found their role gaining greater importance. They were made advisors to the government and began to formulate Orang Asli policy. In 1954, the Department of Aborigines was set up with the police special branch in charge of security. This paternalism was the narrow end of the wedge for outright control of every aspect of Orang Asli lives. Today, the Department of Orang Asli Affairs and the police special branch still exercise guardianship over the Orang Asli. Having dealt with the natives, the British now had to contend with rising Malay nationalism. After securing their own business interests, the British felt they could withdraw and in 1957 bestowed independence on Malaya. The Malaya they left behind was now a multiracial collage of communities, divided by ancestry and religion, brought together by British commercial interests and held together by only the vaguest notion of a common destiny. From the smallest neighborhood shop to the largest city company, the Chinese and the British dominated the economy. Although ethnic Malays were more than 50% of the population, they held less than 2% of the country's wealth. The Malays, who now regarded themselves as indigenous, began to feel they were paupers in their own country. Deepening political and economic divisions led to seething resentments that erupted into violent race riots in May 1969. The following year, the Malaysian government formulated an economic plan aimed at transferring more of the country's wealth into the hands of the Malays through preferential policies. They spent billions. The Malays were given generous allocations of land, money and educational opportunities. Within a single generation, a confident, prosperous new Malay middle class had emerged. But the truly indigenous people did not benefit from this policy. 80% of them still live below the poverty line. Dr. Colin Nicholas is the founder of the Centre for Orang Asli Concerns. The Malaysian sociologist has spent years immersed in issues affecting the indigenous tribes. Politically, they were a very small community. Not only were they a small community, half, half a percent of the national population, they, they were dispersed in different communities with different languages, different cultures. They were not united. So being disaggregated, they were easily dominated you know, and left alone. So, um, and the dominant groups were vying for more and more benefits for themselves. So it's like, why give to somebody who's not asking for it? The government addresses these concerns through its Department of Orang Asli Affairs. Well, uh, Orang Asli, uh, um, they are supposed to be like other citizens in this country. Uh, the government uh, wishes to see them uh, to be equally developed and advanced like other races in this country. But uh, their physical location in this country uh, poses pr problems for, for them to, to be equally advanced. To deal with this problem of isolation, the government seems set on persuading the Orang Asli to relinquish their deep attachment to the land, abandon their culture and become Malays. In real terms, in, in terms of policy, you find that uh, there is an active program of, uh, of Islamization among the Orang Asli, you know. Uh, 
again with a view to changing the, changing the culture to integrate or to assimilate with the Malay sector of society. This is the policy. It's uh, addressed in many of the documents. It's been stated in many seminars and it's frequently out in newspapers and so on. In fact, if you look at our government censuses and records, the Orang Asli are generally classified as Malays. Cadangan ini kan orang asli sudah lama memikirkannya. We have thought a lot about this plan. We, the Orang Asli, feel like this. In the world, there are many different races, but we, the Orang Asli, want to be our own race, from birth to death. We don't want to become another race. We would like to participate in government work programs, but their religious program we don't want. We want to follow our God in this world. But examples of assimilation are right here in Bida's village. When Inda's granddaughter Pipus was born, an officer from Orangasli Affairs told them her name wasn't suitable. He advised them to choose a proper Malay name instead, and so Pipus was registered as Rosmawati. But assimilation seems to have its limits. After more than 40 years, there are no Orang Asli in senior positions in their own department. We are encouraging uh, you know, more, more Orang Asli to, to apply, but uh, very few apply. The normal recruitment uh, process is uh, advertisement and ap application, eh? interview, and then uh, there, there's a decision. Eh? And um, these positions are not many. So once it's done, it fails, then uh, there's, there's, there's no more opening. Unless there's a future re reorganization, uh, upgrading, whatever, and then uh, there'll be opening for them. Without any real representation in their own department, many Orang Asli feel that the government lacks sincerity. Largely left to their own devices, life for them continues as it has always done. We have never been satisfied with the Orang Asli department. Their help is never consistent, always erratic. There is always talk about projects to help the Orang Asli, but it's all talk. The help never comes in full, right? That's my opinion, the opinion of the headman of Pratap. Bida's opinion is understandable. Only 46% of Orang Asli have piped water and only 36% have electricity. Life is pretty basic. Yet there are power and phone lines in this Malay village. But when Bida asked to have the electricity supply extended 200 meters up the road to his village, he was told it would be too expensive. With electricity, if we had it, firstly, it would be for the school children when they read their books at night. Things like television and radio are second and third considerations. Most importantly, we want the children to be able to read in bright light. When they read with oil lamps, they ruin their eyes. The bulk of uh, the, the, the government funding uh, are being allocated to the uh, uh, Ministry of Rural Development. So um, our arrangement with that ministry is to provide a list, list of requests by Orasli and uh, details of their, of their villages and and, and and whatever particulars uh, the, the ministry wishes to have. So. Um, the ministry uh, has its own uh, 
priority list. So we have to uh, to abide by by the by the list by the, by, the, by the ministry. Although nothing's changed much for the Orang Asli, the rest of Malaysia has been marching forward. National pride is the driving force of Malaysia's remarkable economic expansion. From being just another struggling post-colonial nation, Malaysia now revels in its role as the standard bearer of the developing world. The tin mines and rubber plantations of the past have given way to cars, commerce, computer components, and a relentless consumerism. New wealth, new lifestyles, new realities. The brave new city of Kuala Lumpur is only 70 kilometers away from where Indah lives. But the distance might just as well be a million light years. Indah and Kung still spend their days harvesting and splitting bamboo to be made into joysticks. For their day's work, they will each earn one dollar. But the forest still provides almost everything they need. Life's easy in the forest. There's tapioca, sweet potato. If we have rice seeds, we plant rice. Food is never a problem. No taxes, no bills. We can build huts in the jungle for free. And there's fire in the jungle. There's a resin we use to make fire. Don't disturb us in our jungle. We're fine. Sometimes the jungle turns up something extra special for the cooking pot. This five-meter python will provide enough meat to feed half the village. Gutting it is a skilled job. One slip of the knife and it's spoiled. For the children, it's a hands-on lesson. The snake's arrival was very timely. It was a welcome contribution to preparations for one of the Tamuan's most sacred traditional rituals, the Sawai. There are several taboos attached to the Sawai. It cannot be held outdoors, so the Orang Asli create the jungle in their homes. Only then will the spirits deign to come. The Sawai serves many purposes. It renews the contract of cooperation between man and nature, between the dead and the living, and it keeps the tribe's oral traditions alive. But the reverence that the Asli feel for the land is not shared by the money culture's boom-time mentality. Modern urban uh, human culture uh, sees nature as some commodity, timber, minerals, you know? and that attitude is in direct conflict with the Asli's unspoken spiritual connection with the land.